good. Yay. Thank you, Dom, for fixing that mic. How many of you wanted to be in New York with them? Yeah, thought that looked fun. Uh, you can go ahead and put my first slide up there. Oh, I'm sorry. Butch is not through. Everybody give Butch a hand. Yay, Butch. Butch, are you through? Okay. All right. All right. So we're going to continue in our series called Healing the Nations. And um, I'm just going to jump right into it. I'm super excited about this message. Last week, Paul shared this um, scripture, and I'm going to share it again. Revelations 22, 1 and 2 says, Then the angel, and this is John the Revelator, seeing a vision exiled on the Isle of Patmos, the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, right there, we know we're not dealing with earthly things because rivers don't flow from lambs and thrones. So we know we're dealing with heavenly things. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. Right there, we know we're not dealing with earthly things because how does a tree stand, one tree, on each side of the river? Bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Right there, we know we're not dealing with earthly things because time's all mixed up in that. And then the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Right there, we know we're not dealing with earthly things. So John is saying, I've been seeing rivers, I've been seeing mountains, I've been seeing fruit all my life, but this is not what I'm seeing, what I've seen all my life. In other words, the Lord is opening the heavens and saying, I've got a whole new view for you. And that's what church is for, and that's what church is about. And the word for healing there is not the same word used for the miracles Jesus did. That's a different word for healing that implies miraculous power. That word is therapuo, which is the root of our word therapy. So I want to announce to you that God has healing therapy for all kinds of sicknesses, including financial, as Pastor Paul just said. Healing here is from that root. It is the release of the whole wisdom of God, which brings all kinds of cures and provides healing in a wide variety of ways. I said a wide variety of ways. Therapuo includes miraculous healing, but is not limited to it. Woe be to the church that says God doesn't do miracles anymore, because he does. But there's also a woe to say if I didn't get it as a miracle, If it was a process, then it wasn't God. That's a woe, right? Listen, God has so many therapies you can't even imagine. Did you know you could get healed as you paint? You could get healed as you paint. In fact, I had a word for somebody once that had a physical illness that I felt like God was going to heal them as they painted. But they wanted to get healed first and then paint. And I'm not saying that that is, you know, the case in every time. But what I'm trying to say is we've got to open our minds to a therapeutic God. Listen, he's issuing therapeutic things forth into your life all the time. That's not the problem. The problem is us recognizing them. So if we have a box that says, I walked to the front, hands were laid on me, I walked away feeling the same, we just limited God. What if he downloaded a therapy in you? What if he put a desire in you to dance? And that was going to somehow be therapeutic. Listen, and then if you saw somebody that that happened to and you went, okay, well, then I'll dance. Well, maybe that's not your therapy. It's personal. It's personalized. I love that there's a fruit a month. Every month. His mercies are new every morning. Every month they're new. Every person they're new. What are the therapies that God has for you? Listen, I don't know if y'all don't like that word. Maybe it makes you think you need a... You need a counselor or, you know, maybe it makes you feel messed up. I just love to embrace the fact that I'm kind of messed up. And, uh, you know, so like if, you know, here's the line for healing therapies. I'm like, I'll be first in that line. (laughs) Bring it on. I got no shame on that. And if we do think, well, I don't want to look like I'm needy, maybe we just need to dance in the therapy a little bit. Wow. So don't just go for miracles. Add in the therapies. God has a whole variety of therapeutic activities for your life. (laughs) You know, here's another one. Did you know that in Africa, many times, because of the culture and the pagan culture they get saved out of, none of them know how to swim because they're afraid that the spirits live at the waters. So Africans classically do not know how to swim because in their old religion, the witchcraft religions, they are afraid of the water. So many Africans drown because they don't know how to swim, because if there's flooding, 
They've never been taught. So our friends in Uganda at Wellspring started a program teaching Africans to swim. Yeah. How many of you think that's therapeutic? And one time, Eve Wanjala from Uganda, from Wellspring, she herself as a mom, the swimming programs were for the kids, so they wouldn't drown playing by the rivers. I think that's therapeutic. But Eve had never learned to swim because she was a grown woman. So one day, while Jeff and Donna were at work, we had their permission to take Eve over to their pool. <laughs> I gave her one of my bathing suits. And for the first time ever, Eve Wanjala got in the water and swam. You tell me that's not God. I will fight you. Ha! Because I discovered a God that went far beyond my traditional concept of what could happen, what was allowable at an altar. And he wants to introduce himself to you and society that way too. I'm tired of Oprah having all the fun helping people. With edges, with edges of truth, you know. Instead of criticizing that kind of stuff, why don't we get out there and offer all of him? There was a dream. Graham Cato tells this story all the time. I love this story. A guy was depressed. He couldn't get over his depression. Everybody cast things out and brought things in and did things and bleh, you know, and you know, those people you just say, I can't get him free. What are we doing? You know, anyway, and the guy went to sleep one night as if it's our problem, right? <laughs> That's the faulty thinking there. The guy went to sleep and dreamed a dream. And in his dream, he saw a, this is a South African guy, so he saw a blue pill in his hand that he knew to be the form that magnesium is sold in South Africa. And in his, when he opened his hand in the dream, there was this blue pill. And the Lord gave him, he went and started taking magnesium, and that's all that was wrong with him. In that case, there wasn't a deep other thing. That was therapy. Come on, magnesium therapy if that's what you need. Now, somebody else might need to go in a room and actually go, Jesus, where were you in some of these moments? But the point is not slapping a one-size-fits-all. Did I mention there were 12 fruits? And I think 12 is just ex increases exponentially, exponentially. I really do know that word. But I am tripping all over. Oh, by the way, do you not love these pictures? Some, somebody once said to me that they don't think that surrealism is a godly art form. Well, try to paint heaven without being surreal. There's a tree that grows on both sides of the river. If you want to be surreal, try painting some of the things Ezekiel saw. <laughs> Come on. I mean, again, God is not limited to our concepts of what he should look like. So open your heart. And that's the whole message this morning, is being childlike and opening your heart. So you know this familiar passage, Luke 18, 16 through 18. This is the Passion Translation. Jesus called for the parents, the children, and his disciples to come and listen to him. We are going to talk a little about children this morning, but we're not going to talk about children like what we should be doing for them. We're going to talk about children like what they're modeling for us. Then he told them, never hinder a child from coming to, be, to me. Let them all come. Right there, there's a mandate for children's ministry. Let them all come is the mandate and the condition, commission for children's ministry. For God's kingdom realm belongs to them as much as it does to anyone else. They, the children, demonstrate to you what faith is all about. Yeah. Learn this well. Unless you receive the revelation of the kingdom realm the same way a little child re receives it, you will never be able to enter in. So if Jesus said that, it would behoove us to figure out how a little child receives it. And that's what we're going to do today. Other translations say the kingdom of God belongs to one such as these or of such is the kingdom of God. I like to think of that as the kingdom of God is fully permission to flow right through them. Of such, coming forth from such little ones, the kingdom of God arrives on the earth. What if childlikeness furthers healing? Let's, yeah. let's explore the ways. <laughs> How do I love you? Let me count the ways. How could childlikeness benefit us? Let's explore the ways. First of all, the first way I want to nominate for your thinking. Children are immersion learners. Immersion learning is like the difference between reading dozens of books about the ocean versus actually scuba diving. 
immersing yourself in the reality. Adults tend to read about something to learn. Children look for an experience. So this is especially, immersion learning has to do with language learning. That's the term, that's where education uses it. Uh, linguists agree that foreign languages are best taught in the earliest years, and language immersion is the single most effective method for learning and teaching a new language. Children more easily take in cultures and process holistically. So these immersion learning classrooms, and, I, and there's an ad for one that I read about, so they will teach your child Mandarin Chinese, simply by you bring that child as a toddler to their classroom and in the classroom they speak nothing but Mandarin and the child learns it because they're new in their processing they're young in their processing when you provide hundred percent immersion to toddlers they understand the language within a few months and by the end of a year language language ready children are speaking it not because of any special language training techniques but because that's the way the early childhood brain works. When Kylie Voltz was here a couple of weeks ago, she's eight years old, I think, and she's Swedish. Eric Voltz's granddaughter was sitting right here on the front row when Tab and Dom shared their stories. You should have heard her English. She's Swedish. Her mother is Swedish. They live in Sweden. She speaks fluent Swedish. Her English was perfect. Why? Because she came over here over and over and stayed in homes where they spoke English and she's an immersion learner because she was too old to make it too young to make it hard now why is this important because God has his own kind of language yeah. heaven has a language we would learn it more quickly if we became immersion learners I know you're saying yeah but I'm not a kid but we're brand new born in the kingdom so maybe you are Maybe we can access that kind of learning, no matter how jaded we think we are. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14 says, And this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught us by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. Heaven has a language. It's not our language, but we can speak it. And it actually is our deepest language. It's just our heads don't know it yet. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God because they're old people that think they can't learn Mandarin. <laughs> I'm mixing my metaphors, but keep following me. The, uh, but the Spirit of God, and he considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. In other words, my grown-up head gets in the way and goes, well, God's not that good. Religion gets in the way and says, God can't speak to me that real. Religion gets in the way and thinks, oh, this time you're going down. Because you didn't blah, 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 fill in the blanks. But your spirit speaks God's heaven language. And your spirit, in fact, the thing in you right now connecting is the fact that you're going, wait a minute, I'm hearing a different language and I was born for this. So there's a child inside you that gets it. There's still the hope of immersion learning. John 6, 63, Jesus said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. So all of you who have tried to process scripture with your natural mind and your flesh, may I release you from that task this morning. Walk out of here without it. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. God speaks the language of the spirit. John 4, 24, God is spirit. Therefore, that's the language he speaks. Now, why you might need to learn some immersion learning about the Spirit is because if you don't, you might misunderstand Him. There's two ways in which God's heaven language is different. Number one, it, whoops, that's number two. Number one is it messes with time. It messes with your concept of time. Okay, so when God speaks Spirit, He says you're healed. You say, I'm not. He's messing with time. You were healed 2,000 years ago, and to him you're healed right now. But when you're going, no, 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 symptom, you're not speaking spirit. You've got to have that. Your mind's arguing for the right to be sick. <laughs> have you ever done that? <laughs> there, you, it's true. God's going, you're healed. I did it at the cross. I was there, I remember, he says. And you're going, yeah, see, I wasn't, and right now I feel sick. <laughs> 
And you have this little funny moment, and I think the father's so loving and intimate with you, he dances with it, and you're like going, you realize I'm arguing for my circumstance when the living God is telling me I already took care of this. But what is he doing? He's messing with time. Because in the spirit, you have access to all the time. Then, now, and in the future. He's not insensitive to your need. He just knows what he did to take care of it. (laughs) Do you really want him? to get totally down in the dumps with you. I mean, can you imagine a God who would go, you're right, you are really sick. I didn't, I didn't think of this one when I sent Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's unconscionable. He could not be God and be like that. So Romans 4, 17 says, the God who calls things that be not as though they are. The law says do, grace says done. And actually... The opposite of law is not exactly grace, it's spirit. In the spirit, whatever God's calling for out of you, he's already accomplished in you, and you're getting to release it. In the spirit. Your healing's already existing in you, in the spirit. Now, the other thing he messes with, he messes with time. He also messes with space. There's space being messed with. I have a photo. I have photos of space being messed. He messes with scale. So, the Bible, for instance, is all about seeds, itty-bitty seeds. Like, if you read the Bible a lot, you would think, this God is obsessed with seeds. It's almost like he made them. (laughs) Oh, wait, he did. He talks all the time about seeds. And when he wanted to change the world, nay, the universe, what did he do? He sent an itty-bitty seed into Mary. And it had to grow up. And become a man, lots of pitfalls offered there, die and be resurrected, it was a seed. So when you have this big old need, and you're like, God, I need a big miracle. Many times he goes, here's a itty bitty seed. Plant that seed. Because he's not limited by scale like we are. He doesn't see big like we see big. And if you don't know this about him, you can get messed up. You need to be an immersion learner about the language of the Spirit and immerse yourself in the way he speaks. Because 2 Corinthians 4.17, he says this. He talks about our troubles. Anybody got any troubles? Anybody got any struggles? Anybody got any big needs? He calls them these light momentary afflictions. Now, how is that not insensitive? (laughs) Because he doesn't see scale like we do. He's speaking on a scalar quantity of, I know it's bad. He's not insensitive to your hurt. He feels what you feel. He cares. He knows. But he also has a heavenly perspective. He has a spirit perspective. He speaks spirit language outside the realm of your circumstance. So he's offering you to join him and be an immersion learner of the language of the spirit. I'll take him up on that. How about you? In this kind of picture here, when you do this trick, you see what they're doing, the trick of perspective in the two pictures. She is not holding the Sydney Opera House, you see. Uh, It just looks like that. That's called forced perspective. And that photographers play with your eye. The Holy Spirit is a master of forced perspective if you need it. He will take your mind and help mold it into shrinking your problem to a manageable side if you'll let him. The Holy Spirit knows how to work with you. He knows how to work in your perception. All right, that was number one. Number two, children have a beginner's mind. Now, that term is used in Eastern philosophy, but I'm mad because they stole it. It's God's idea. Because Jesus said, let the children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. That's a beginner's mind. When you look at the world, uh, one, one way to say it is, let me get this right, we all so saw the world more clearly when we saw it for the first time. We, children, in a beginner's mind, are open to wonder. When's the last time you really stopped and wondered at the marvel of the universe? Can I tell you that brain chemistry is the door to both worship and wisdom. And sometimes we're trying to worship by duty, and we didn't stop and get amazed first. And I'm, I'm, listen, you can train your brain to be amazed. It's, it's focusing your attention on the goodness of God. If you need some lessons, walk out and look at a tree. It's amazing. 
Look at the root system that goes down in all kinds of fractal branching. And for those of you who were doing any bets on would I get the word fractal in, I did it. <laughs> the branches, everything, even the layout in the forest is, is, the layout in the forest is on the same fractal pattern as the branching of the trees. What? That makes me wonder. Now, that wonder is not just a useless, oh, let's have a little sweet devotional. There's a usefulness to the brain chemistry that pulls away from the drive and the habituation of, I got to live, I got to get it done, I got to get, I got to survive. Wonder is healthy. God created your brain chemistry for something like wonder. It doesn't mean you walk around going, hey. It doesn't have to mean that. It means you have a healthy breeze of lightness blowing through you. You see the world, the universe, yourself with softer eyes than religion told you to see it. And then some worship might occur that was real, not just I am here now, so I will now raise hand, raise hand. Instruction one, raise hand. Instruction two, focus on God. Instruction three. God wants worshipers, not duty fillers. So wonder and wisdom. Have you ever had a clog? There are stories after stories of scientific breakthroughs that came not when the person was hard at work in the lab, but Watson, James Watson, saw the structure, the double helix of DNA, playing tennis. He put aside the work, and he went off, and suddenly from the place in him that wondered came the structure. He dropped his tennis racket, ran in the pub, and declared, I've solved it. And he had the man who discovered the structure of benzene is a man named Kakuli. He was dozing. This is pre, way pre James Watson. He was dozing by the fireplace. Benzene ring is a six carbon structure. That's the basis of a bunch of life. But no one knew that benzene could be a ring. And he fell asleep, dozed in that hazy state. And I don't know if he's a Christian or not. And he had a vision of a snake eating its tail. And he went, it's a ring. And the whole face of chemistry changed. So that's some wonder. You tell me, li listen, I, I am done with this kind of thing being treated as, well, that's, that's nice. <laughs> you who like, you artsy people, go do that. This is health on every level. Yeah. This is the way God created our brains to work. And when we cooperate with it, it's amazing how the childlikeness of the beginner's mind makes us like him. Open to learning. Oh, let me not skip this one. All things se still seem possible because life and collected disappointments. Anybody here have any collected disappointments? I do. Haven't taught them yet that things might not be all possible. Are you with me? Open to learning because everything is new. They haven't yet given up on dreams because of knowledge they acquired. Picasso said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. The trick is to keep that attitude when you do acquire some knowledge. I watched a TED Talk this week that Sam Brownback sent me, and one of the guy's main points, he was a designer that used to work for Steve Jobs, and he said every day Steve Jobs would tell them, stay beginners. When you design products, stay beginners. Don't design them for the techies. Design them for the person that's going, now, how do you use this thing? They said Steve Jobs would sit in planning meetings and stare at his hand because he was, he wondered, he, had, he was alive with wonder about the human hand. That's why your iPhone is just a, because he was, he was like, how can we make that more accessible for the dude that doesn't understand all the software? That's some wonder. And it's time the church rose up in it. Okay, I want to tell you a story here. And I have my husband's permission to tell this. Uh, and that's the only permission I have, but I'm doing it anyway. Whoops. Okay. So I just said this is about keeping dreams alive. This is our youngest son, Noel, who is at UT as an engineering student. And he, when he was little, he, I truly believed raising him at this age, he fully believed he could fly. And he loved capes, so you can see him. This is an early form of a cape that was an, indeed a bath towel. And then for this birthday party, which is either, that must be three, um, I made a, the whole theme of the party was Super Noel. And so everyone had capes, and he, that was his cape. Problem was that we lived in a house with a balcony. And um, honestly, I, I could tell from his behavior 
He believed he could fly so much that if ever that balcony was unlocked, he was going to put his cape on and go out there. So I had to police the lock on the balcony vigilantly. Fast forward, and this just hit me the other day. Oh, by the way, the thing in the middle is, I didn't mean this as a commercial for kids ministry, but we, if you're in my youth group, we did this in youth and we also did it. Megan and Candace are nodding over there. We did this thing where we believed God to make acronyms for our name. And Heather, then Farrier at the time, was doing kids' church. And we decided, let's just launch it with the kids. Let's, and so Noel was this age. And I'm not kidding. Heather did not make this up. He made it up. Did I mention he's an engineering student? <laughs> and his acronym that he came up with, did I mention we trusted God for acronyms <laughs> that were prophetic? He wrote, new ideas on stuff, energetic love. Now, is that not the best definition of a kingdom engineer that you could ever think of? I mean, he was expressing his calling. Also, he was wanting to fly, which was exhausting. Fast forward over here, and this is Noel. I knew it would get me. This is Noel last summer representing Texas Hook'em. Aerial Robotics. Yeah, they lost. I know. LSU. Go Tigers. I had to say it for my daughter-in-law. Um, he was re- he's on the Texas Aerial Robotics team. What do they do? They fly drones and go to national competitions. And then on that particular day, on purpose, he chose to wear his bell, wait for it, not helicopter anymore, but flight t-shirt where he was doing a summer internship and now has two job offers. He's still finishing his senior year, but listen, the trick, the trick was keeping him alive from jumping off the balcony, but also keeping his dream alive. And if religion has scared you, maybe somebody was trying to keep you jumping off a balcony, but listen, don't let them rain on your dream. Thank God Noel pushed and shoved and pursued and still said, I want to have new ideas on stuff and energetic love. I mean, through, I don't know if we did it right or wrong, but thank God something nurtured the seed of the dream while we tried to keep him from jumping off the balcony. But what are your dreams? They're still inside you. I know you look at him and think, well, he's 22. He's at the, he's at the seed of his life. Well, number one, he, do, he thinks he's old. Uh, but <laughs> he thinks it's late. But number two, oh, my goodness, it's never too late. And some of those dreams are still inside you. And guess what? You're wise enough now to not jump off the balcony. Okay, check. Learned that lesson. Got that. But am I just sitting inside in fear? Let's don't. Ephesians 4.23 says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed is Anna, which means up, and neos, which means new. So it's literally saying, come up to new. Ascend to new levels of spiritual comprehension and reality. Gaining new strides in sanctification because of what you see. Your behavior follows what you see. The word for mind there is the word nous. That's the Greek word. It's the faculties of perceiving. It's your perception. It's the organ of where you receive God's thoughts through faith. And it probably comes from the word gnosko, which is experiential knowledge. I'll show you a little diagram on that again in a couple of slides. But just to say, it's the faculty of mind that's necessary for processing reality. Can you just take that definition? Your noose is this part of you that's going, what's real, what's not real? And it is working all the time, is it not? When people have trauma, that's what got messed up. When people have memories that trigger them, there's like, wait, what's real, what's not real? Wait a minute. That's, your spirit is full of the God reality, but your noose is sitting like an umpire calling shots uh, in the middle of all that. Some people call it the mind's eye, the intuition, the perception. It's the ca- capacity to experience reality. So when Ephesians 4.23 says be renewed in the spirit of your noose, what it's offering you is the possibility that spirit can invade that processing. Hey, 
can I reiterate to you in multiple therapeutic ways? Multiple therapeutic ways. Spirit is pneuma. Some translators use the word attitude. Weymouth uses the word temper. But what if it's more? Uh, neuroplasticity is all the rage. What that simply means is your brain can be reformatted. It can change. How amazing is that? What if you can import a literal spirit attitude into the very structure of your brain? What if it's an infusion? I'm offering you the fact that I think that's God's plan A, is that he infuses your thinking. So thinking of that word infusion, in Luke, this is from the Message Bible. I love this because remember I said the noose is where you define what's real for you. Jesus said, what I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. This is Luke 12, 29 through 32 in the message. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, natural things. But you both know God and how he works. Here's the phrase. Steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, and God provisions. So that's a teapot with loose tea. I know we, most of us don't do it that way, but that's the ultimate steeping, isn't it? Yeah. Steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. You'll find all your everyday concerns, human concerns will be met. Don't be afraid of missing out. Don't have FOMO. You're my dearest friends. The Father wants to give you the very kingdom itself. Get wet soaking in God's reality. Now, tea snobs actually say that if you're doing tea like, tea like this, you can reuse those leaves. Thank you. I was like grounds because I was coffee, coffee, <laughs> coffee. You don't reuse grounds, do you, right? No. <laughs> oh, you can? <laughs> oh, Shelly says you can. Hey, it works. Um, but what they say is that when you reuse them, the flavor evolves with each use. So isn't that interesting that if I one time meditated on an aspect of God, I might come back and get a whole new layer as I steep myself in the God reality of who he is. It's an infusion. So warning, cheesy thing I'm about to say on next slide. Warning, Christians trying to be creative up ahead. Here it comes. <laughs> Look out. Okay. Because remember I said the Greek word for that reality processing organ is noose. So I said, I came up with this all by myself. Whoops. See, the, the slide didn't want you to see it. There. Don't let your noose become a noose. Thank you. Because actually, that's what we do. And so right there, you see the word noose in the middle of that little diagram that has other Greek words. Like the suke is your soul. The dianoia is actually your small mind. It's called discursive thought. What that is is a little chatter of background noise about, did you pay that bill? Did you turn that iron off? Did you, you know, that kind of stuff. That's, that's happening. Uh, and then the cardia is the heart, which is the seat of your affections. So can you see on that diagram, your little noose, your little decision maker is trying to process all this stuff. All this input, all these buzzing bees, all these concerns, all these fears, all these feelings, all these hurts, all that stuff. It needs a spirit infusion or it will become a noose. And God has general spirit infusions where he goes and he has specific ones where he speaks truth to a lie you've believed. God has all kinds of infusions. It's a, you can't get them all. We're not going to have an altar call at the end and go get one. I mean, we could. You get one. The point is, it takes a lifetime. He has therapeutic living for you. 12 months of the year, he has it. And I thought, okay, for some of you in the room will appreciate this, especially people from my youth group back in the day. I'm, Megan loved this song. I thought of Mumford and Sons' The Cave. Okay, didn't get a lot of cheering, but... Well, that was fake turn just because I asked for it. I don't trust that, but no, you did. Cassandra, Cassandra, that was real from Cassandra. Listen to this. It says, and I, I want to sing it, and I will hold on hope, and I won't let you choke. 
on the noose around your neck. I want to say that's what the Abbey's about, is we won't let you choke on the noose around your neck. When your noose tightened up around you and your judgments about what God wanted out of you were choking the very life out of you, we may not fix it in a moment, but we sure won't let you choke. We want to help loosen the noose around your neck that religion put on there so you can see the reality of God and let the goodness of God come back into the reality so you can process Him, not just a set of behaviors. It goes on. And I'll find strength in pain. This is what it looks like to get out of that noose. I'll find strength in pain and I will change my ways, and I'll know my name as it's called again. So make your sirens call and sing all you want. I will not hear what you have to say because I need freedom now, and I need to know how to live my life as it's meant to be. Go download the whole song. Don't let your noose become a noose. Thank you to Mumford and Sons for that. Oh, I can't tell that joke. Anyway. <laughs> I know a thing. Oh, can I tell that? I really want to confer with my husband at this moment. Well, it's not a joke. It's about what the Mumford daddy said in front of... I can say it? Okay. Uh, what's his name? What's the main Mumford? Marcus. Marcus's dad is a pastor in England, um, and a lot of our friends know him. And so they said, <laughs> so Marcus Mumford was raised around the gospel. And so once, and he said, our friend told us that Marcus Mumford's dad, Pastor Mumford, is a very, very proper British man. And so <laughs> he stood up at a convention after Mumford and Sons had been famous. And he said, first of all, let me begin. I apologize for the F word in my son's song. <laughs> I didn't know if I could tell that. I'm sorry if I... I think Paul told me I could tell it. I really want to put this off on you. Okay. Let's move on then. Okay. Children have not... Okay, I'm going to hurry. Children have not yet become aware of norms and adapted to them. There comes a point in a young adult's life where they become aware of norm-based behaviors and begin to stifle their own uniqueness in a quest to fit in. I'm guessing that's around junior high. But in gifted children, this comes early. I was that. I can literally tell you the moment that I remember choosing to almost lie about what I thought because nobody else thought what I thought. I remember it. And I remember a little something died inside me. That my, our teacher in first grade was pregnant, Miss Walraven, at Country Day. And the people at my table, I was seated at a table with all boys, and all the girls wanted it to be a girl, and all the boys wanted it to be a boy. That's what kids do. They're cheering for their gender. And all the boys went, I want it to be a boy. I want it to be a boy. I want it to be a boy. And went around the table and got to me. And of course I wanted it to be a girl. I don't even know what I wanted. I probably wanted to analyze the existential you know, like, well, let me think about it a while. I don't know what I wanted. I, like, I didn't even really want to play the game. But when it got to me, I remember it. Like, I literally remember it. Like, it's a where were you Jesus in this moment thing. I, it went around, and I said, and I want it to be a boy. And it was my first consciousness of being inauthentic. And something in me went off like, I hated that. I don't ever want it. A quest to be authentic was born in me, but why? Because I sold out to a norm-based behavior, and I started being on guard about that the rest of my life, even to the point when I'm around Christians and they all go, well, I like this, 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 and it gets to me, I go, do I really like that? Let me think. I don't know. I want to refrain from commenting. I just want to go away and be authentic a little bit. So... Then what's crazy is, as adults, much of the Holy Spirit's work is to undo some of those choices because those choices are inner vows. We go, I will never stick out again. And we just limited you, didn't we? Like God's going, but you were born to stick out in these areas that I prepared you for. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. You see the problem. So we have LTS. We have one-on-ones. We have sessions. We pray with you and we go, can we break that inner vow? And so many times you get right up there with that person to break that inner vow and the person's going, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know if I can survive without that vow. And you're like, but freedom's on the other side. It's a norm-based behavior. It doesn't, God wants to reach you authentically, not through the group. 
So here's a picture of normal. This is a normal curve. Insecurity can breed the worship of normal. But normal is not the goal. Created identity is the goal. Great if your created identity is the center of the curve. My husband is not boring, but there is something very tan about him. We used to kid him. We did. He's so Midwestern. Am, am, am I okay? Am, am I okay? He can't say anything else. We will talk later and we'll be okay. But we, we, had a, we used to kid him. We used to say if he bought wild colored clothes, they would turn to tan when they hit his body, which is what I adore about him. <laughs> It's what I adore about him. I need that in my life. Now, nobody is boring. Please know nobody is boring. Okay. No! <laughs> Don't you dare make me look bad right now. Um, <laughs> the point is, what I'm trying to say is there's nothing boring about the center of the curve. In fact, the curve is just a line with some shape. We're all a point on the line that is fascinating, all on its own. But he's a contrast to me, who I actually think tan changes color when it hits my body. So, it's great if you really are the center of the curve, but it's also great if you're not. In the end of the day, it's just a line with shape. The only normal we want is the normal the cross provides. So, those things off the edge are called standard deviations who is sciencey enough to know the word standard deviation. Do you hear even in the word deviation, that's a little bit of a hit? Don't deviate. Don't be deviant. Listen, anywhere you are on the curve, it's, if it's real, is where God is. And it's normal for you. I'm advocating blow the norm out of the water. Even, you know, okay, I feel like I handled that badly. I apologize. But... But even if maybe the lie of the enemy is you're so normal, you're boring. That's a lie too. Okay. Religion is a set of norm-based behaviors. Reality is an incubator for healthy kingdom discovery and healthy life expression. You can lose the norm-based behaviors that aren't really you. And so this is a scene from Runaway Bride. Julia Roberts said she liked her eggs whatever way the guy she was currently dating liked his eggs. And in the end of the day, she didn't know how she liked her eggs. And so she does this whole thing, and she cooks all the kind of eggs. And then she calls Richard Gere up, and she goes, Benedict! She finally found her in the midst of just acclimating to anybody else's likes. So norm-based behaviors, what do you want? God wants to take you on an investigation. Now, closing or continuing to edge that way. Children are content to sit in a parent's lap most of the time. We sang this song today, He loved you before you knew it was love. They don't yet have a sense of needing to earn love or analyze it. And I already had this in my slides before God, uh, Paul shared it at the rally. Zephaniah 317, he gets up off his throne and dances over you. God danced the day you were, before, you were born. You know why that's significant? It's before you had a chance to perform for his love. He danced over you before you did anything good. It's pre-performance. We pray over the day of people's birth because that lets them know that he was celebrating over you before you knew what celebration was all about. Lastly, children say mine a lot. This is Sam Brownback and Pastor Cody White. And, you can, and Sam, really, of my three children, he said mine all the time. He'd go, mine, 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 mine. mine. And he looks like he's saying over Cody, mine. Yeah. <laughs> but we can learn a truth from the adorable Sam Brownback that wanting and acquiring is not selfish when God has freely given. Children say mine a lot, so should we. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, All the promises of God are yes in Christ, and so through him our amen, which is our yes, is spoken to the glory of God. The promises of God, there's a process here. Jesus made them available. We make them ours by saying, wait for it, mine, mine, all done in him and through him, but we actually have a speaking part. Just somebody take a picture of this slide, not that one, this one, because I'm bringing it down to a close. 
These are Philemon 1, 6, Psalm 116, 12, and 13, Romans 8, 32, Luke 12, 32 are all scriptures that shout, take it, claim it, say mine, okay? But I'm not going to take the time because I want to get to my ending, which is this is volleyball. I don't play volleyball. My daughter-in-law coaches volleyball. Morgan plays volleyball a lot. But what do volleyball players do? I've watched the games, and what do they yell? Mine. Now, sometimes they're going to get in an awkward position to say mine, and sometimes they're going to say mine and blow it completely. But children aren't afraid to do this, especially when it comes to the prophetic. So in a minute, I'm going to show you a little short video of Seth Dahl from Bethel. He was the children's pastor at Bethel. And this is where I want to tie it back into us and our children here at the Abbey. And he's going to talk to you for just a few minutes about how easily children flow in the prophetic. But I don't want you to just think, oh, let's release the kids. I want you to think about yourself. You know, a lot of the, Alyssa, when she, we went to her games when she was coaching seventh grade volleyball. And more than once, somebody went, mine, and then blew it. A bunch of us in this room have said, mine to God. I think I have something. I'll minister. I'll share. I'll prophesy. I'll do something. And then we fell flat on our face and we went, oh, I, so, listen, that's just part of the game. The faith to keep yelling, mine. I receive that promise from you, Lord. That childlike gumption to go, mine, I see something from heaven coming. Mine. <laughs> I mean, there were sometimes those seventh grade girls. Well, Alyssa, Alyssa, Alyssa hates to lose more than she loves to win. <laughs> and there were moments I saw her face because she was trying to create an effective team and they're all going, mine. Sometimes they, hey, this happens in church. They yell mine and smack right into each other. Mine, but two minds and smack. Have you ever had that happen in church? I have. Like, hang on, I had a word of the Lord. No, I had a word of the Lord. What? Oh, smack. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Church is the weirdest thing on earth, and I love it more than anything. It's so amazing because it involves people. So we're going to watch this video, but I really want to challenge you, and I want it to challenge us. Then I, have, I will read one closing thing, and then we'll be done. So, uh, Sam, this is Seth Dahl from Bethel talking to you about children and the prophetic. Hey guys, my name is Seth Dahl and I'm author of a book called Win Win Parenting as well as some curriculums for training children in the things of God. And today I'm guest vlogging here for Frequency. I'm excited to join you and I'm gonna answer the question, can children prophesy? And my simple answer is yes they can. Uh, when we want kids to learn to prophesy though, we need to teach them how God speaks. So he doesn't just use English, he doesn't use whatever language um, from that you speak or that we speak, the different languages. He does speak in those, but he uses so many else as well. So one of the most common languages God uses is pictures and visions. Now I would say videos for children because it just helps them kind of understand what they're going to be seeing in their imagination. but quick story about this my daughter uh, just the other week we were uh, speaking at a conference she was helping me and at the end during ministry time she's like dad I got prophetic words can I go give them so I said of course and she's running around giving prophetic words but after I asked her how were you getting the prophetic words she said I was seeing pictures I was seeing videos and I remembered something in my life while I was looking at this boy and I gave him a prophetic word from that thing I remembered so there's three ways when you're wanting your kids to prophesy that you can help them understand how God speaks. But another thing that's really important is uh, why God speaks. You know, 1 Corinthians 14.3 says, He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to people. Now those are big words for kids, so I've redefined them to be this. Build up, cheer up, and draw near. And if kids always do that, then you have the ABCDs of prophecy. Always build up cheer up and draw near you know one thing I tell kids is that uh, any any word from God will lead back to God some people have got this wrong over the years you know they give prophetic words that push people away from God instead of bring them near and so it's just really important when we're teaching kids to prophesy or we want our kids to prophesy that when they learn why he speaks one reason is to bring people back to him to reconcile them to him 
Uh, so uh, I was going to say, and I forgot it earlier, is 1 Corinthians 14, 31 says that you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And so with kids, they're definitely included in the all, but it's really important you just give them a place to practice and to learn and to develop and to give them feedback. And that way they're learning and they're getting encouraged that they are hearing God and um, that they are interacting with Him and that people are getting blessed by what what they're saying to them so one more fun story and then I'll go uh, I had a girl one day in kids church grab my shirt and say pastor Seth God showed me a dream that he gave to a bunch of kids last night can I share it so I gave her the mic she took it and said last night God gave some of you a dream that you were driving a school bus but it had no wheels so the angels were taking it around from country to country to country who had that dream like seven kids stand up and I, I was already surprised, but then she said, that was a dream from God, I'm gonna interpret it for you now, tell you what it means, and she just unloads this prophetic word. She said, you guys are leaders, that's why you're driving the bus, and you were going from country to country, but the, bu the, the bus is like a bumblebee, and when you go to countries, it's gonna be like you're pollinating those countries just like a bumblebee pollinates flowers so that the flowers turn into the fruit that is supposed to be growing. And she's like, you're going to pollinate countries so they grow what God wants them to grow. And I'm sitting there looking at her like, wow, the only person who did this in the Bible was Daniel, giving the dream to the king and the interpretation, the prophetic, the prophetic word from the dream. And I became very aware, yes, children can prophesy, <laughs> but not just prophesy simple. They can get very detailed, very accurate, very clear, very profound, very strong prophetic words for people, words of knowledge, all of it. You know, children do not have all the filters. You tell them God wants to talk to them, they're ready for God to speak, and they're not complicating it at all. So to wrap it up and to answer the question, obviously I've already said it, but yes, children can prophesy. Just tell them how he talks why yeah. he talks and give Come them a on. place to try to learn and watch them. So the most profound thing that was said this whole summer was when Kim Rollins said, what we want over there, it's already fantastic, but what we want over there, what we want out there, what we want everywhere is that it's the same slice of the hologram. What's going on in here that is Abby, we want that everywhere. And so it's not like, yay, our kids are going to prophesy. It is yay. But it's also, we want to release that culture of hearing from God without filters, a beginner's mind, a willingness to strip away the disappointments. It takes courage, but the Holy Spirit can make you want to. And also, you're with people that you're safe doing it with. So, my last summary slide, let's all just be big kids before our Heavenly Daddy. This is not just a children's emphasis Sunday. It's an all of us as children emphasis Sunday. Let's believe he gives generously and speaks specifically a school bus that turns into a bumblebee. I mean, school buses are yellow and bumblebee color. Wow, that's amazing. And let's allow him to do therapy in his own way on our, quote, mature cynicism and renew our childlike faith. May we all be Noel, believing we can fly, even if it takes 22 years to do it without jumping off a balcony. I still believe I can write bestsellers. It's never left me. I still believe, my goal was to be on Oprah as an absolute, no compromise Christian, making a statement in all of what she shared. Well, she took her show off the air. I didn't make it, did I? She's still around. I don't know. I'm just saying, I didn't jump off a balcony, but I'm still around. What about you? What are your dreams? What is your childlike faith that can be renewed? And last of all, may we never hinder our own children because of our own experience. So instead of, you know, I hindered Noel from jumping off a balcony. But my prayer was that I never hindered him from chasing his dream. And that's what we as parents need to be cleansed of is our, I don't want you to get hurt if you, you know. I, uh, I, spared, I spared Joe in this morning. 
but can I really do that? Because we have three sons. This is, I'm going to tell, and I'm, and I'm closing with this, I'm going to tell my worst moment in parenthood ever. Would you like to hear it? Please like to hear that. <laughs> I need to share. Anyway, he was in junior high. He went to Lake Country, and they transferred to, um, to that junior high over there. Azel, <laughs> that town. <laughs> What's that town? <laughs> and, um, and he played football. And he was a lineman. He, they, they, he had never played football before. Lake Hunter didn't have football back then, so they stuck him on the line so he could hit somebody. That, I learned that phrase in football. And I picked him up one day after practice, and he said, because he was stout, man. And um, he said, I want to be a, um, a, a linebacker. I don't want to be on the line. I want to be a linebacker. And you know what I did? I, my parenting faith got squelched by my parenting fear. I thought, oh, they have little people, <laughs> little fast people, little agile, whatever. I just knew this, this side. He was a lineman. Not many linemen go from line to linebacker, right? Does anybody play football here? Do you understand? <laughs> no, okay. Well, some of you don't. The point is, I didn't want him to get hurt. So I went off on this super spiritual thing. I actually used some great Pastor Dwayne White teaching, wrongly applied. I said, well, you know, one of the clues to your destiny is the way God made you. And so, you know, the way God's formed you and made you is probably a clue to where you need to play on the football field. I was trying to protect him from being rejected. Do you understand? So you know what he did? Because he's Joe, he quietly <laughs> just let me do my super spiritual babble and ignored me completely. <laughs> and then he went home, and he built a training program, and yeah, seventh grade, he did it for himself. He took himself off all sodas. He, took, he studied what to eat. He policed his sleep schedule. He, like, transformed himself. By the time he graduated high school, he was second team all district middle linebacker, for the championship team of the Azel Hornets. He did that against his mother's warning. <laughs> I was so in the flesh. I was afraid. I did not hear his heart. I heard, oh, that's not going to work. I know a little something, something. I'm not trying to talk to your parenting today. I'm telling you that story because how many times have we done that to ourselves? We're policing our own dreams. We're policing our own yearnings. And Joe Brownback is the hero of that because he heard me and he went, I don't know, a little bit might have went, I'll show you, Mom. <laughs> Thank God that he didn't buy my, my super spiritual babble. <laughs> Thank God. I mean, the worst thing you can do is invoke God in it, and I did. <laughs> God made you not a linebacker. <laughs> but what has been said to you? You know, somebody may have said, honey, God didn't make you an artist. <laughs> somebody could have said to me, Perrin, your books haven't sold. Somebody could have, what is, what, 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 what? Whatever it is, there's a gumption and a gut in you that can do better, that can, that can let the Holy Spirit massage the hurt and birth some dreams that he's been calling for all these years. So do you want to come and close today? felt like you might. Awesome. Let's have our worship team come up. Give her a big hand. That's a great word, isn't it? As they're coming, let's stand up together. How many are ready to become a child again? I believe that is the, the key to the kingdom, is having a beginner's mind, letting go of preconceived expectations of the way, the shape, the time that God has to move. And I love, love, love what Seth Dahl said about the prophetic. Build up, cheer up, and drop draw near <laughs> there we go well, I think we're all plugged in now probably 
So, I just want us to open our hearts. Let's close our eyes and open our hearts and just turn our imagination towards Him and just allow Him to speak to us today. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this space. We welcome you into our thoughts and our imaginations. We invite you to reveal the Father's heart and plan for us personally or for somebody that's on your heart that you want us to share with. right now there's lots of I see like popcorn popping with some creative ideas I know even in the last two weeks someone came to me that the Lord gave him a dream about a business and in two weeks things have fallen into order and they are getting ready now to start a brand new business because the Lord just so clearly spoke to them. And I sense there's others that have got business ideas that the Father's just revealing, maybe confirming. There are some that had some ideas that you put on the shelf, Pat putting a little box in your, imaginary box in your mind and put it on the shelf and the Lord's saying it's time to take it off the shelf, open that box, brush off that idea, and let's see what I can do with that idea. The shift of seasons and new beginnings. Definitely just see that all over you, Steve and Carla. It's like a new, I just see a rainbow over you guys. Uh, a rainbow of divine favor over you guys in this new season. And he just says everything, he's making all things new. He's making all things brand new. It's a new day. It's a day of new beginnings. Hallelujah. So we're going to close today a little bit differently than we normally do. I'm going to ask our Abbey, we got some of our Abbey prayer partners at the front. I'm going to ask our uh, vision team as well just to be available at the front to pray for people. And some of you may have something for someone just I'm just going to release you to share what the Lord has given you in the context of these boundaries. Build up, cheer up, and 
draw near. Build up. Let's say it out loud together. Build up, cheer up, and draw near. And with that focused purpose, I'm just going to release you to pray for one another today. The Lord may have given you something for somebody. Go build them up, cheer them up, and help them draw near to the Father's heart. Okay? And then if you are new among us, maybe this is your first time, maybe you've been a few times but haven't had an opportunity to meet the leadership team. Some of our leadership team is going to slide out to my left and your right through those double doors. And we'd love to greet you and shake your hand and give you a gift if you've not received one already. And our worship team is going to just lead us in a little bit of worship. They're going to sing. And I'm just going to release you to share. Can you do that? Hallelujah. Well, then do the stuff. That may lead you to just putting your hand on them and praying for them and seeing healing. Just build up, cheer up, and help them draw near to the Father. And do that throughout your week this week with no filters, but only expectation on God. God bless you. You're dismissed.